Oh, some of you don't know me. My name's Steve Capella. I'm the manager of gambling treatment and prevention at the Zuff Center. We have the largest and most successful gambling program in the state of Ohio. Um, and the reason I believe we do is because not only do our substance abuse, uh, our substance abuse um, treatment people work on the substances, but we spend a lot of time in the gambling group talking about behavioral addictions. And some of you know I'm 13 years sober now. And, and I struggled from the time I was 13 years old when I was addicted to morphine till the time I was 47. I've been in, in and out of jails. I've spent a couple of years in abandoned buildings. I've been in a dozen treatment centers. I was in this one twice in the 1990s and I could never figure out why I kept learning about drugs, but I kept coming back to treatment centers. And when I got sober, um, I started, I was exposed to the gambling program and, and gambling is a behavioral addiction. And I thought, oh my goodness, this, this has always been my problem. This is what I never worked on. And so the, this group today is about, about substance-based addictions, but it's also about the behavioral-based addictions and the traps that we step in. It turns out that addiction is a giant game of whack-a-mole and you pound it down in one place and it pops up in another. Does anybody ever played whack-a-mole? There's, there's, there's 16 people in the room and they're all shaking their heads, yes. And, and if you ever, you, and, and it keeps going faster, right? You pound down one mole and think about the story of your lives as, as, as our addictions progressed and we got older. Was it, didn't it all keep happening faster and faster and faster? It took more drugs and less result. After the first time I was arrested, I started getting arrested more often. I started going to jail for more longer. I pounded down one thing that pops up in another. And so this is a way to explain that. And, and we're gonna have a lot of fun today. Now remember that the, the, the video camera cannot hear you. So when I ask you to shout something out, I will repeat it. But if, if we start having a conversation, it will get completely lost and we'll have to cut it out. So, so let's talk a little bit about substances that we can become addicted to. Now, I remember I told you before that I was addicted to morphine at 13 years old. And when all the other kids were learning to spell and punctuate, you know what I was doing? Drugs. All right. So, so if it's a complicated word, you better be able to help me spell it. Or can we all agree that's just the way we're going to spell it today? Yes. Um, okay. <laughs> all right. So, so let's first talk about the substances. And I think substances are easy to get because because we're we're in a recovery housing unit. Most of us have just come out of substance uh, use or abuse treatment programs. What are some of the substances that we can become addicted to? Beer. Beer. Coke. Meth. What else? Barbs. Bar barbs. Dot dot dot. <laughs> spell it. Adderall. A D E R A L. That's the way we spell Adderall today. <laughs> Psychedelics. Let me spell that. Psychedelics. L S D. Uh, <laughs> how about how about shrooms <laughs> you know what the first time i ever did mushrooms i was like 20 miles from home i was driving and i had bought a quarter ounce of mushrooms and i didn't know how many to eat so i ate the quarter ounce of mushrooms and trying to get home the the whole world started melting <laughs> and, and when you do mushrooms it makes you throw up and the more i threw up the higher i got Took me like two days to get home, <laughs> but but I have lived to tell the tale. Uh, what else? Weed, marijuana, spelled W E E D, right? <laughs> Fentanyl. And Y A L. G Gabby. <laughs> Gabby Penton. Gabby. Del Delotted. I don't even. Well, how many letters are in Delotted? 
dowels. <laughs> Buttons. Buttons, perks. Perks. I'm sure there's a, eventually someday there will be a pharmacy tech watching this going, what is the matter with these people? <laughs> Peyote. I can't spell it. I'd rather put it on there. <laughs> what up? What else? What what are the other? There's there's ecstasy, X P C P. Uh, what what are the other drugs? Molly. Oh, uh, sure. Well, we're going to talk about that one. What, what other, what other drugs? What, what other? We got a pretty good list going here. Anything you guys think of? Anything else? Inhaling. Oxy, inhalants. Thank you very much. One of the first things I was ever addicted to was sniffing model airplane glue, back in the day. Inhalant. Janine has a master's degree in English, and she's over here just shaking her head in, in shame. <laughs> okay. Acid. Oh. Special K. I don't even know. How about how about what's that stuff? K two. Look, look. It's it's pretty easy to understand substance-based addictions and so you, you know as, as time goes on i've asked a few thousand people this since i started working at the sub center 10 years ago um how old they were and what was the first thing they ever got high on and the number one answer always in every group of people is ding 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 about 12 or 13 years old and it was usually weed or alcohol um but whatever the first one was, the other one almost immediately followed because then it was about access, right? If I knew the guy that would sell me weed, he would sure go down and buy me some beer. So I, I finally got the hookup that I'd been looking for. And, and for me, I think I always knew I was going to get high. It was just a matter of time. But it turns out that there was a bigger trap. And in the 35 years... I spent earning my bastard's degree in drug abuse. I, I discovered later that I was also troubled by a whole bunch of, of behavioral-based addictions. And I'm going to write these down in an order because I'm going to talk about them in a certain order. And, and, the, and the behavioral addictions are, wait a second, media, and we'll talk about which, e what each one of these mean. These are called process addictions, by the way. Relationships. Another one is codependence. Another one is performance. Cults, food and sugar. You know what? You're exactly right, my friend. Sex. Oops. Can't spell sex. <laughs> I'm 60. It's been a long time. <laughs> and, and, and the final one is rage. And let me just clarify that a little bit. Rage. And and it turns out that these were the traps. These were the reasons I struggled because what I discovered later in my professional career was that I never walked into a treatment center with one addiction. I walked into them with a whole, bu whole bucket full of them. But I could only identify the one. It was the one I thought it was. And so let me ask you as a group of people a question. How many people started gaining weight when you got into your treatment programs? Virtually every end has gone up. 
And, and, and let's talk about what the nature of addiction is. The nature of addiction is I take something external to me, a behavior or a substance, and I internalize it for one reason only. It has nothing to do with triggers, has nothing to do with coping strategies. I never did anything because of brain chemistry. I never considered my brain chemistry. I did everything I ever did was because it made me feel the way I wanted to feel at that moment. If I was too high one way, if I was doing too much cocaine, I needed some Xanax to bring me down. If I was too drunk, I needed cocaine to bring me up. Everything I ever did was about making me feel the way I want to feel. So the reason I start to gain weight, because let's think about it, was the nature of addiction. I take something that is external to me and I internalize it for one reason only. It makes me feel the way I want to feel. And if I can't get high and I can't chase down my girlfriend and I can't do any of those things, I'm going to love me some Oreo cookies. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk past the bag of potato chips and I'm just going to take a few every time, but I walk past it 30 times a day. My, this is a true story. My mom swore that I was addicted to animal crackers. She said, she said she used to tell everybody, the, the whole family, at, at the reunions, I had her trained to bring me animal crackers when I was just a little baby in the crib. Before I could walk, before I could talk, I'd be in my crib. And, and it was a different time. I was born in 1961, but, but I would be fed and clothed and, and screaming my head off. I would be inconsolable until she brought me an animal cracker and I would shut up until it was gone. And then I would immediately start screaming again until she brought me another one. And that was a trait I carried with me my whole life. And if you've ever seen anybody in the front of a treatment center who wasn't gonna get their animal cracker today, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. That, that oh my God, I'm gonna die and it's all your fault stuff. Um, and, and, and all the victimhood that comes with that. Um, but I, I grew up and, and it wasn't, I gotta tell you though, I still love me some animal crackers. Right, right, thank you very much. The plain animal crackers, as we all know, are for children. The ones with the pink frosting are for adults. And, and does anybody ever eat like one or two animal crackers or do we have them by the handful until the bag is gone? Because that's the way I roll, baby, I'm addicted to everything. My mom, my, my mom talked about that until the day she died. That was, that was the story she loved to tell. Later in my life, it was about blue popsicles. My family figured out they could control me with blue popsicles. I would, I would do my homework, I would cut the grass, I would do whatever it was they wanted me to do for blue, blue popsicles. Then later, by the time I was 11 or 12, believe it or not, in Toledo, Ohio in the 1960s, there, were no, there was no pizza. Pizza was a brand new invention. And if all of us kids were really good, my aunt would come over on Friday night and we would order JoJo's Pizza. That was the first pizza place in town. And, and buying pizza back then was really weird because the boxes were really thin cardboard and it'd be like glued all together, but we loved it. And, and we would all change our behavior to get what we wanted because my family had figured out I was easily controlled by behavior. Turned out to last for my whole life. And so, Addiction's a game of whack-a-mole, and I went from weed and alcohol to sniffing glue to pills to LSD to, to I, I almost overdosed and died at about 15 years old, and so opiates uh, were off the table then, uh, and for me it was about cocaine and speeders and LSDs, and because I had to go the other way, it, it really scared me. See, I pounded down one mole and I popped up another. But I've been working here 10 years and I've been in and out of a dozen treatment centers. I was in this building twice in the 1990s struggling with my addictions. But I didn't get sober then because I was never really working on the problem. It turns out that there was a whole bunch of other things going on in my life. And I think the one thing that's not on this list, that if I were to develop this list, I, would, I think I would add this criminal thinking and behavior. 
you ever guys, you guys ever like, I'm not going to do drugs. I'm just going to sell them. Uh, how does that work out? Uh, right, right, right. My problem, my problem is heroin. Alcohol has never got me in trouble. That number, I do all my best thinking at about six beers. Um, but I would get into these treatment centers and something really weird would start to happen. I'd get there about two or three weeks and I may have begged to get into that treatment center. And look, I'm the world's greatest look farmer and, and, and manipulator. And if you're six foot three, you know, a 50 year old man, and you're standing in front of a 23 year old intake clerk bawling your eyes out. Cause that's what you think you need to do to get where you want to be. You're going to get anything you want. And it turns out that I was addicted to those behaviors. We talk about being addicted to the lifestyle. Look, RV camping is a lifestyle. Drugs is a death style. A lifestyle is this ever, a lifestyle is this, this ever increasing, more wonderful life with more personal wealth and more friendships and more. Uh, we talk about drugs and alcohol as a lifestyle in this ever contracting pool of misery with fewer and fewer people and more and more negative consequences. That is not a lifestyle, my friends. That is a death style. Remember the old TV show back in the 80s, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous? Do you remember when they came out with Lifestyles of the Drunk and Stupid? <laughs> yeah, I did, the, I did the pilot episode for that. It was never released. Uh, but it was a hell of an episode. You should have seen it. <laughs> but it, it turns out that, that I had a whole bunch of other things going on. It turns out that I was engaged in these behavioral addictions long before I was, I ever did drugs. Um, long before I ever got high, it may be 10 years old, in, the, in, the, in 1970, if you wanted to play video games, you need to go to a video arcade. And when you go to a video arcade, it costs 25 cents. Well, eight-year-olds and 10-year-olds don't have 25 cents, especially not then because was, that was like $2. And, uh, and I would steal money from my parents back then to go to the video arcade. And I'm going to tell you, my friends, I, we all chewed the same dirt. But for me, walking out of a video arcade when I was 10 or 12 years old, walking out of a crack house, walking out of a a bar after drinking for 12 hours, or because I'm a problem gambler, walking out of a casino after 12 hours is the exact same experience. That gut-wrenching, horrible, I would do anything. I'll be in the crack house trying to sell my shoes or get a front. I'll be in the casino walking around for hours trying to find, back then there were coins and buckets or, or a credit or a dollar or walking around trying to borrow money. I, I would be in the in the arcade looking at is a little kid trying to find a machine with a credit left in it. It, it doesn't matter for me, drinking, drug and gambling, or media. Media, video games, cell phones. I have an iPhone that has absolutely zero apps on it. And the reason why, because if I go down that road, I'll never stop. Anybody know anybody who's addicted to their cell phone? Anybody know anybody who's addicted to texting? You ever been out to dinner with someone who's addicted to texting? And, and, and it's like, look, we're recovery people. There's a good chance we need to have some really hard conversations with some people we really care about. And, and, and we're, we, we, you know, I'm sitting at dinner and, and I'm trying to talk to somebody and they're like, and, I, and I'm like, no, 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 please. This is really important. Just set that down for just one minute. I, I, I'm like, please, 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 just give me, just, just give me one minute. Oh my God, look, this guy's dog just took a poop and it looks just like a squirrel. I'm like, I'm trying to talk to you. This is very important. Or do you know that guy, 40 years old, in and out of treatment 10 times, finally convinces his parents what he really needs to stay sober is the brand new Xbox Game Council. Now he's living in recovery housing. You know these guys, right? They're living in recovery housing. They're playing video games 24 hours a day. And yeah, they're not getting high. But they're not going to work and they're not paying their bills. And if you are in a recovery housing unit, here's your job. Your job is to build a place to go to. 
Because if you don't build a place to go to, you can only go back to where you came from. And we already know what happens there. And you've probably proven that a few times already. Because if you're in a recovery housing unit, you're going to need three to $5,000 to move out, to buy some drapes. You ever moved into an apartment with a spoon and a blanket and a, and a roll of aluminum foil to put on the windows? That's crappy. You're gonna need all these things to create a life. Look, you can't get into a treatment center for a media addiction. Go back down to our intake department, walk in there and go, my God, I think I'm addicted to my phone. I'm, I'm addicted to video games. I'm addicted to texting. I'm addicted to watching TV. All I do all day long is watch TV and I haven't gotten a job and I haven't cleaned up my mess and I don't go to meetings and I don't do anything because I have a media addiction. And you know what they're gonna say? I don't even, we don't know what, we can't help you. But here's what happens. I'm gonna tie them out of recovery housing. Mom's gonna get tired of my crap one more time and tell me to leave. And when all my stuff is sitting on the curb and I've got nowhere to go and I am miserable, have you ever been so miserable? You said to yourself, if it's gonna be this bad, I might as well be high. Here's a person who pounded down a drug addiction and up popped a media addiction and they never recognized it as a media addiction. But it chopped their legs out just as surely as the drug addiction did because when I was desperate and miserable and had nowhere else to go, the only thing I could think of was I might as well be high. And that got me back into the next treatment center. The next one is relationships. Look, many of us come in relationships and that's another animal. And, and if there's supplies, it applies. And if it doesn't, let it fly. But but there's nothing worse than a match made in treatment. A, a, a match made in therapy, it's the most beautiful. No, it's, it's, it's a mess because you know how we do it. We're like, you're addicted to heroin? Oh my God, I'm addicted to heroin. You, you, your family doesn't talk to you. My family hasn't talked to me for years. You live in an abandoned building? Me too. What was your address? You didn't own a toothbrush for three years. It was four for me. Oh my God, I've never had this spiritual connection with another human being like this. <laughs> it was like God put us together. It's it's like it's like it's like I've never never felt this close to another human being. <laughs> Sound familiar to anybody ever seen this before? Let's move into my uncle Ernie's basement and, and we'll live magically ever after. And then, and then three months later, we both show up and we realize I can't stand this person. And then what was the most loving relationship, the most intense level of love that I've ever known in my life then turns into hallway sex. Do you guys know what hallway sex is? Always sex is when you both wake up in the morning and you're walking to the bathroom and you're like, fuck you. <laughs> but, but we can't split up, right? Because we have relationship addictions. And if we do, I'll rip half of your guts out and you'll rip half of my guts out and I will be Ill, 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 inconsolable until I find another weird ass relationship to get into. This is a true story. It's a little weird, but it's true. I'm 45 years old. I'm living in my mother's basement. The story is I'm taking care of her, but the reality is she's taking care of me. All right. Every once in a while, I would tell mom, look, I want to go down to the bar. She, I was unemployed, hadn't worked in years. She would give me $20 just to get rid of me, I think. And I would go down to the bar to find the girl of my dreams. I'm not particularly good looking, but I guess I'm sort of a funny or something maybe because I could usually get the job done and I could find the girl that would go back to mom's basement with me. And, and, but I always found like one insane girl after another. And, and I could never figure it out until I got sober and I realized 
Steve, you're a crackhead, unemployed, living in your mother's basement. Little girls don't grow up dreaming about unemployed crackheads living in their mother's basement. If you find the girl that wanted to go home with you, she was crazy to start with. One, one crazy relationship after another. It, but here's the thing. And if you think about it, and look, I don't want to overstate this because people, people do find long-term relationships. I, my, my wife in recovery, but I was three years sober and she was way more sober than that, but not in a treatment center. But I'd done it. I was in jail in a work release in downtown Toledo and met the girl of my dreams that turned out to be a nightmare. I met her in jail. What did I expect was going to happen? My whole life has been media addictions and relationship addictions, but when my heart is broken and I'm inconsolable and all my stuff is back out on the street, have you ever been so miserable you thought, if I'm going to be this miserable, I might as well be? And then there's Gumball Machine on the phone. You know why we always call them Gumball Machine? Because you give him 20 bucks and he goes, and up, up comes a $20 piece. <laughs> over and over and over again. Stay away from gumball. Stay away from cotton ball. And if they say that peanut or popcorn, their girlfriends are coming, don't show up. <laughs> the next one is codependence. We talked in the last episode about most of us have came into these places with a two or $300 a day drug habit. That's between seventy-six and one hundred nine thousand dollars a year, and no job. Where's the money come from? Well, think about it. We become the greatest luck farmers in the world. We did an episode on what that means. We're the greatest manipulators, and every I built this this whole herd of people around me that are all helping to support my habit. And because we know how we do it, right? We go to job and family services and get the food stamps, which you trade for the dope. Then we go to the church and get the food. I need the double dose. They cut me off food stamps. And then I trade that for whatever I can get for it. And then I call mom. Yeah, I need a hundred bucks. You know how we do it. We talked about it before. Codependence isn't a problem. It makes the world go around until it becomes codependence. We're the world's greatest lick farmers and manipulators. And if we're truly, this, this was the trap. I would sober up and not do drugs, but I was still trying to manipulate the hell out of everyone I knew to get everything I wanted for free. Look, I'm a convicted felon. And I thought my problem and the reason I couldn't get a job was because I was a convicted felon. But that turned out not to be the truth at all. My problem was is that before I was a convicted felon, I was an unconvicted felon. I had my, the reason I had trouble getting a job was I had no permanent address. I, I had no references. I had no job history. If, if, I'd, if I'd even known how to put a resume together, it would have been a blank sheet of paper with my name on it. Those were my barriers. Not that I was a convicted felon. Convicted felons, I mean, there are some crimes, but for the most part, convicted felons get hired for very good jobs all day long. I'm a convicted felon. Codependence. When everyone, I'm, when I'm still trying to get my $100,000 a year from everybody, and I'm still not getting a job, and I'm still not working on my recovery, and I'm still, look, we're in recovery housing, right? I worked on a residential unit for many years and I would hear people on the phone. Yeah, mom. Yeah, no, it's no, it's nice. It's really nice here. No, no, the food's free. Yep. No, no, but the food's free, but it's a dollar a day for a, for a spoon and a paper plate. Yep. And, oh no, you can come and visit, but it's $5 a day for a parking pass and you got to pay it a month in advance. No, 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 you can't bring it in cash, bring it in $1 bills because I have to go in the back room and put it into a special vending machine. And then I will tell you what number you can park in. But sometimes you just park in anyone you want because people don't pay attention to the numbers. And, 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 and people are, 
And we are still manipulating and we are still lick farming. And we are still engaged in all these codependent relationships. But to it, look, it's hard to work on these things. It's easy to show up at a meeting and, and, and play video games or text your, or, or engage in trying to seek your other favorite thing in life. Because because you know that you ever go to an AA meeting and everybody's in the back row talking to the, the boys or talking to the girls? You know what we call that? Relapse row. <laughs> because nobody's there for the meeting. They're all there trying to, to meet the love of their life or whatever it may be. The next one is performance. Look, in the basement of this building is a gym. And there's a few guys around here and they're like, good morning. Good morning. We even got a program. We got a, there's a recovery program in town. It's all based on this. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? I am excellent. I'm modeling my thigh muscles. You know, um, you know how are you going to stay sober today, Joe? I'm going to do thirty thousand pinky pull-ups. I'm doing, I'm doing two hundred and fifty single finger push-ups. I'm gonna, <laughs> Good morning. Which way is the cafeteria? It's that way. <laughs> you, you know, it's or so. So performance can be, you know, taking any part of my recovery too far, like exercise or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with that being part of recovery. But how many people in this room are really good at building up a good life and tearing it apart? Building up a good life, virtually every hand is up. Build up a good life, tear it apart. Build up a good life, tear it apart. Build up a good life, tear it apart. Over and over and over again. Look, <laughs> I'm going to tell you something, and I've, I've talked about this before. People who struggle with addiction are some of the brightest, quick thinking, most adaptable, resilient, resourceful people on earth. You got to be to pull this off. I, I wake up every morning hungover, dope sick, half my brain tied behind my back. I need to come up with $300 to get it done. How often do we fail? Never. Or because we're relentless, we will never give up. It, it, it goes to the codependence, it goes to the performance, it goes to a whole bunch of behavioral addiction and problems. Um, my problem is I, I get, I'm really smart, I'm really quick, I'm really likable. But, but every good deed that I do is to cover up an evil intention. I'll do you a favor, but I'm going to call it back one of these days. I'm, I'm always setting the stage for my next, my next lick, my next, my next come up, my next hustle. Performance addiction. I, I'm really smart. I, I can get the car back, the girl back, the apartment back. I, I gave all my, they hauled all my old furniture out to the street. So I got to, I got to perpetrate like I got some recovery going on. I got a house full of running center furniture. I, I got brand new tattoos and, and $300 tennis shoes. And I'm like, where'd you get the tattoos? I have, I bought it with my food stamps. What? I've, I've actually heard that before. <laughs> Where, where'd you get the tennis shoes? My girlfriend buys my $300 tennis shoes. What? Is, would that be, what? what is the problem when your girlfriend is buying you $300 tennis shoes or tattoos? We seek out the people. We seek out other sick people for every taker. There's a one that has to be a giver. I don't know which are sicker, the givers or the takers, but we find each other. We have relationships and codependence and performance addictions. And, and performance is really sinister because because we all need it. See, the problem with performance addictions is we need them in their life. Drinking, drugging, and gambling, I can put up on a shelf and in no way does that diminish my life. But sex and media and relationships and performance and, and food, I need food. All these things, rage will keep me alive. It keeps me out of dangerous fight or flight sort of situations. But I have a performance addiction. And I get it all back, but I overwhelm myself. And now I'm making a hundred, I'm just use this as an example. I'm making a hundred dollars a week, but I'm spending $110 a week. I'm working 60 hours. I'm mad at my boss. He won't give me more hours. I'm, I'm completely overwhelmed. I'm, I'm, 
I'm completely frazzled. I, I say, oh my goodness, I need to go to college. I need to go back. I'm completely unprepared. I'm already overwhelmed. I sign up for college. I go buy, go get my fast phone money. I get $50,000. I buy more tennis shoes, more jeans, more tattoos, all the things you need to start college, right? I say, gee, what would I do in college? I know. I used to love cooking crack cocaine. I'll get a degree in chemical engineering. I, I, I borrow all the money. I show up in college. I walk into the auditorium the first day. Maybe you haven't done this, but we've all done something similar. And I walk into the university and, and on the board are all these molecules drawn out and scientific formulas. And, and I look at it and I think, oh, darn it. I just remembered. I've never taken a science class before. I rapidly become overwhelmed, throw up my hands, and sing the Addicts National Anthem, which is... <laughs> and we all knew what it was, right? And then I do that. Maybe you don't, but I always did. Then I did that junky pride in reverse shit. Oh, I'm a piece of shit. Why do I even try? I always fail. No. I've never recognized what my problem was. Addiction's a game of whack-a-mole. I pound on a drug addiction, a pops, a, a media, a performance, and a codependence addiction. I don't recognize those as part of my problem. They overwhelm me. Does it matter what chops your legs out, or does it only matter that your legs are chopped out? Three months later, I went from being at the top of my game to being completely miserable. I'm overwhelmed. They're discharging me from school. My whole family's like, there he goes again. I'm losing my apartment. I'm losing my house. Everything's coming apart. My shit's sitting on the curb. And have you ever thought, if I'm going to be this miserable, I might as well be? Hi. Right. Exactly. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Because this took me out every time. Because I was never working on the problem. I thought if I just worked on the drugs, if I just worked on the drugs. See, the problem with fighting drug addiction is there's nothing to win. You can duct tape yourself to a chair. You can put gloves on your hands and duct tape them and, and hide in the closet. And you know what you get for doing all that? White knuckling it through. You know what you get for doing that? Nothing. You, the only thing you get is not doing the thing you think you enjoy doing. And that's a really crappy reward. Who would do it? Because if you do it that way, I bet there would be a 90% plus relapse rate. Wait a minute. There is a 90% plus relapse rate. Huh, I never made the connection. How about you guys? Is my problem with substances or is my problem the behaviors? Or is my problem all of it? I keep working on this, and I keep getting the same, the, the same result. Many of us have been here many times before. The next one is religious cults, but not like going to an AA meeting at the church and putting a dollar in the plate. I'm talking about that. Remember that guy in Waco, Texas, David Koresh, or Scientology, or who's that guy in French Guiana? All those people, or um, Jim Jones. Jim Jones, remember that? That was 40 years ago. Some of you weren't even born and you still remember it. Yeah. Um, and remember food and sugar, I asked you the first thing, the first question I asked was, how many people started gaining weight when you got into your treatment program and virtually everyone raised your hand? Because, because food and sugar was my original addiction. I was a little baby in my crib teaching my mother to bring me animal crackers. I came, out of, I came out of the box that way. Just one thing led to the next thing, led to the next thing. I was really good at it. And before I knew it, I was everywhere, all over this board, constantly, my whole life. It was a giant game of whack-a-mole. And see, the opposite of addiction is not abstinence, it's responsibility. It has to be a responsibility, not connectedness, because you can't connect until you become responsible. Sometimes, last week, I, I turned 13 years sober. Life's, a sober life has truly been a blessing. I, uh, 
But over the years, I've, look, I don't play with drugs. I don't get around them. I built a life where drugs are not part of my life. But every once in a while, I recognize I have many addictions. Food and sugar is one of them, believe me. This is not the physique of a crackhead. All right. Um, when I gained, stopped smoking crack, I gained 100 pounds. I smoked cigarettes for 43 years. I lost a little bit of my, my dope weight. And then I quit smoking after 43 years and I gained another 50 pounds and now I'm starting to take that off. But, but see, I pound down one addiction and up pops another one. We're gonna talk about gambling. Gambling's the one thing on here. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit when we get done with this. But food and sugar was my first addiction. It was my first love. When I was lonely, when I was hungry, when I was tired, food was always there. Food never rejected me. And God knows I never rejected food. Food never left me. Food never, food never gave me problems. Sometimes I want to conduct an experiment. Steve, you're not going to mess with drugs and alcohol. The consequences of that are, are too important. But I'll conduct this experiment. I will get myself an ice cold glass of milk and a spoon. But spoons freak me out because I always have to see if the back of it's burned up. Grandma used to say, where's all my spoons? Well, she didn't know I was down in the basement burning them up. <laughs> and I had figured out how you get the back char marks up. So, so they talk about triggers and a trigger doesn't make you do something, it makes you think about it. And I would, I would get the spoon and it would immediately, like a bolt of lightning and I'd have to check. And so I got a glass of milk. I got me a spoon that I have to keep checking. And I get me a fresh, uncracked bag of, man, you guys know me, right? Oreo cookies, but not the regular ones. The regular ones are for children, right, my friend? We're talking double stuffs. But I'm an old dope fiend. And double stuffs are not going to be good enough. I'm going to start re-rocking these sons of bitches. I'm going to... I'm gonna, I'm going to take them apart. It's like, it's like rebuilding the crack lighter. I'm going to take them apart. I'm going to make octuple stuffs. I'm going to make six double stuffs. I'm going to make octuple stuffs. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to swear to God. Look, I'm, I'm 13 years sober. You can do this, Steve. I'm going to eat four cookies. I'm going to put the rest in the cabinet. I say to myself, you will enjoy them on another day. It will be, it, it, it will be a master of control. Well, you know what happens? An hour later, covered in sweat and cookie dust in a near diabetic coma. I put the last four cookies in the cabinet and then I sat down, you ever do this? And I start to obsess. Oh my God, I can eat the rest of these cookies. Where are these cookies? My nose is itching, I'm itching. I get bubble guts, blah, 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 blah. I gotta go take a poop. Oh my God, I can't, th I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about these cookies. I can't get the cookies out of my head. I could just have these cookies. Nobody would ever know I ate the whole bag of cookies. It'd be completely okay. I can always get more cookies later and I'll put them back and nobody will know. And my mind's racing a thousand miles an hour. And then in complete dis despair, I throw up my hands. I go get the cookies. I run back, I grab the spoon. It freaks me the hell out. I check the back of it. I, I grab the milk, I, I start, Dumping the, cause you know, if you combine these things, it's always better. I'm, now I'm dipping the cookies in the milk. I'm eating them with the spoon. I'm going at it, I'm crazy. I finish all the cookies. <sighs> all the cookies are gone. But if you ever smoke crack, you'll know what I'm talking about. A minute later, I'm looking for the cookie. <laughs> I know I dropped somewhere. I'm on the ground looking for cookies. I'm like picking it up, is that a cookie? Uh, is, it, is that frosting? Oh, it's crack. <laughs> the, the one time in my life, I actually found a piece of crack on the floor, but I was really looking for a cookie frosting. <laughs> it, it turns out, it turns out I'm still an addict. And what I had to come to understand about myself was I was always going to be an addict. Look, I'm 60 years old. I still struggle with I don't struggle with these addictions anymore, but in order to lose weight and get control of my diabetes, and I just had a donut, thank you very much, I had to go on Nutrisystem. Because apparently I don't know what a portion is. I thought a portion was like a giant dog food bowl full of spaghetti, but a portion is apparently about this big and fits in a teacup. It, you ever see the little bag of peanuts and you know, it's only the bag of peanuts is this big. 
And it says seven portions, seven servings. I'm like, wait, what do you do with a handful of peanuts? Look, I always go back to my old addiction because because when my heart's broken and I'm bored and I got nothing to do and I can't do any of this, whenever I walk past that bag of chips, whenever I walk past those Oreo cookies, look, we'll continue to gain weight until we until we understand what all of our addictions are. The next one is sex. And it's not hard to understand how sex is an addiction all by itself. But when you combine sex with drugs and alcohol, it takes a life of its own. Look, if this applies to you, it applies. And if it doesn't, I get it. But it definitely applied to me. Alcoholic sex was stupid. Anytime, anywhere, bathing and teeth were apparently optional. Um, Crackhead sex, you'd plan it for days. It it never bridge up, bridge down. It didn't matter. Nothing was going to happen. Um, <laughs> you could get on the road, but you never got to the destination. You, uh, we haven't had a drink in five days, and the only time you finally get around to having sex is while you're waiting for the dope man. But but you've been high for five days. Nobody's had a drink of water. You're like you're having sex, and it's like the room is getting hazy. Are you smoking a cigarette? She goes, No, I think the rubber's burning. And but. <laughs> But 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 then the meth head, the meth head in me goes, oh my God, quick, we need lubrication. Quick, go drain the oil out of the car. So we drain the oil out of the car. And, but opiates are the best because I don't know if you've ever done this. You ever, you ever, most heroin addicts will say, I've never nodded out. But most alcoholics say they've never had a blackout. I have experienced both. Um, but if you ever woke up on the on the edge of the bed with your pants around your knees, and you don't remember whether you were pulling them up or taking them off. And you look over at the girl you're with and, and nothing happened, right? And she's like, oh, baby, you rock my world. My spine will be out of place for a month. Nothing happened. <laughs> and you're like, oh, yeah, man, we're bad. I got skills, baby. <laughs> and we're looking around trying to figure out, what are we going to do with this trapeze anyway? <laughs> and we all leave. And I'm telling the story, man, I got some. <laughs> She's like, yeah, he thinks he got some. <laughs> but isn't that the game? And the last one here we're going to talk about is rage. And let me ask you this. When we're trying to get what we want and they're not giving it to us, what's our go-to emotion? Right, I get pissed off. I get angry. I, I'm talking I'm talking to my mom, the last person on earth that loves me. I'm like, you've never loved me. You always cared about. And, and isn't it true? The closer they are to right, the more pissed we get. And, 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 and it, it could be like um, me and your mom put a camera in our bedroom and we have pictures of you stealing that money out of the safe. And we're like, that's not me. And they're like, you're an only child. Well, seven years ago, you told me to put that envelope in the safe and you photoshopped it and made me look older and, and you've never loved me. And, and, if, and if angry don't work, then we go to crazy and we start punching the walls and calling people names. And... We got to stop that. We got to understand that for most of us, for most of us, Somewhere in here are all our other problems. And we got to understand that when I pound down one thing, up tops, up pops another. And the last one of these that I want to talk about is gambling. Gambling is, is called the hidden addiction. I have seen things happen you know the problem? Gamblers have the highest suicide rates of all groups of people who start with addiction. About 30% of people, uh, this is a rough estimate of the actual statistics, about 30% of the people who are diagnosed with gambling disorder have thoughts of suicide and about one out of five will make an attempt at some point in their life. Look, I'm a crackhead and an alcoholic and a gambler and I'll tell you what, I could smoke a lot of crack and I could drink a lot of beer. I don't do it anymore, but I used to, and I don't gamble anymore. 
but I stopped gambling long before I stopped doing drugs or, or drinking for one reason only. I stopped gambling because it was affecting my ability to buy cocaine and alcohol. Because I could do something with gambling I could never do that. I can do a lot of drugs. I can drink a lot of alcohol, but, but I'm going to tap out all by myself at about a thousand bucks a day. But I've lost $10,000 a day in a casino. And, and here's the problem. Nobody knows. And I don't walk around like I was gambling and I don't stumble or slur my words like I've been gambling. I don't, I don't, I don't do dumb things and wreck my car like I've been gambling. And if I'm a pretty good actor, I'll go home and no one will ever know I did it. But if I went home drunk, everybody would know if I, if I went home smoking crack, everyone would know. If I went home on opiates, everyone would know. But a problem gambler is a good actor. Could walk into the house after losing. And I've had people in my office tell me this. I lost $60,000 in an afternoon at the casino. And I lost the retirement money and I lost the kids' college money, and the house is about to be uh, foreclosed on and the cars are gonna be repossessed. But I don't know how to tell my wife. And I can't tell the kids that if, they, if I don't do something about this, they're not gonna be able to go to the school they want to. And so a problem gambler can get to a place where, where we never could because we, we may have had success in our life, but our whole life our addictions were getting worse and worse and worse. A problem gambler who's not getting high can actually have the illusions and trappings of great success, the cars, the job. But then one day, it was like he was juggling chainsaws and, and he juggled and one day he missed and his chainsaw came down and chopped his arm off and then all the chainsaws came down. And could you imagine being in, living in a, a certain level of affluence and coming home and telling your wife, or your husband, you know, honey, I, I lost my job today. And she goes, it's okay, we've got our savings. And he goes, no, 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 you don't understand. I lost the savings gambling. And she goes, it's okay, you got the 401k. No, no, that's, that's been drained out. Well, we'll sell one of the cars. No, I'm sorry, honey, I, I, I got payday loans on those cars. Well, we, we got the college money. I'm sorry, honey, I, I lost that last year. And, and could you imagine one, could you imagine when she goes, we're going to get through this together and you look at her and you go, actually, honey, I was fired from my job for embezzling and I'm probably going to go do a couple of years in prison. Problem gambling will get you somewhere. The drugs and alcohol may never get you and the fall from grace, the fall from a position of affluence and authority and respect to, to that, Big Book talks about incomprehensible demoralization. And then there's that thought, and we've all thought it, they would be just better off without me. And a gambler can get there so easy. And that's why problem gambling is such a problem, because statistically, <clears throat> let me share the story with you. My wife is in recovery, but she is not a problem gambler. We went on a cruise ship. Um, don't ask me why. A person in recovery who's who doesn't drink, drug, or gamble gets on a cruise ship. I love being in the ocean, um, but it is a giant bar and casino. <laughs> but so this is a few years ago. My wife's not a problem gambler. And uh, she goes, hey, I want to go down to the casino. So it had been a long day and my feet were sore. And I'm like, I'll watch a movie in the room. Uh, how much money do you want? She said, give me a hundred bucks. I opened up the safe. I gave it to her. I, I rented Guardians of the Galaxy or something. And I'm laying on the bed with with my Diet Coke watching and she leaves and the movie and the, the credits just ended. The movie's just starting and she comes back. And, and I'm like, what'd you forget, babe? And she goes, no, 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 I won $300. So I left and my gambling addicted brain's like, what are you doing? You should have saved and won 5,000. Today was your lucky day. And she goes, no, no, no. She goes, the only way to win is if you win, you leave. And I'm like, <laughs> the, the devil, you say. <laughs> I, I, I could never make the connections because I'm a problem gambler. 
it was it was like when I was a little kid and I was stealing money to go to the arcade and stealing money to go to the casino and stealing money to go to the crack house and stealing money to go to the bar. And I didn't call it stealing, I called it borrowing. But it turns out borrowing without paying back is called stealing. Yeah, stealing. I, I never made the connection. Look, I don't know which one of these affects your life. I'm gonna do another special presentation just on gambling. Um, but, but, I, but I wanna caution you. Addiction is a game of whack-a-mole and if gambling was in our past, say we were gambling for years and years and then heroin or alcoholism, um, much like me, I stopped do, do gambling so I could buy cocaine and alcohol. If, if you were gambling and buying, yes, lottery tickets are gambling. Going to the casino is gambling. Poker is gambling. If, if you find, if gambling was part of your past and you make it part of your present, what do you think you, the odds are that it may become your next major problem? And, and so, so we have to be aware in our life that is, addiction is a game of whack-a-mole. And just like I've, most of us have been all over this side of the board, most of us have been also this side of the board. If I, if I keep, if I don't figure out what my full problem is, because here's the fact, you can only have one recovery. Could you imagine how exhausting it would be to have a weed recovery, an alcohol recovery, a heroin recovery, a sex addiction recovery, a media recovery, a relationship recovery, and be on a diet all at the same time? You can only have one recovery, but you gotta figure out what all your problems are so that it can encompass everything. When I met my sponsor in AA, we talked about all the addictions in my life. Because if the opposite of addiction is truly responsibility, then the challenge for me was to find out how to be, I, there's no way, there's nothing responsible about any of this behavior but I had to find a way to find the thing that always eluded me, balance. How do I have balance in my life with media and relationships and codependence and performance and, and not cults, but food and sugar and sex and rage and, and drinking, drunking, and gambling goes on the shelf because in no way does that diminish my life. Because this isn't about just substances. This is about our behaviors. And I hope you think about this and, and, and cook this into your recovery plan because the, the solution is simpler than you think it is, but I'm pretty sure for most of us, the problem is more complex. We, we simplified the problem and, and, and make the solution very complex and we always fail, but we have to understand we have a complex set of addictions but the solution is very simple. Start practicing responsibility in all the areas of life. Responsible use of media, responsible relationships, being responsible in performance, not overwhelming ourselves. Because it doesn't matter what knocks our legs out. It only matters that they were knocked out. And I want to thank every one of you for participating today. My name is Arturo Javier Beltran, currently residing at the Zeph Center House. Hi, I am Stara Arcuri. Hello, my name is Roy Jackson, and I just attended Steve's class. Uh, my name is Atanasio Miguel Brown, and I reside at Zeph Recovery House. I learned about addiction and behaviors. Um, that the addiction isn't so much as important as the behavioral aspect of it. Um, behavior is like a root underlying cause of the addiction, that the addiction is only 10% of the actual problem. The recognition of my behaviors, as far as uh, relationships goes or codependency goes, I'm gonna uh, put them in the forefront of my priority list as far as what to work on for myself and my addiction and what could help me do for future reference. 
Behavior has a lot to do with addiction and it's pretty much the underlying cause of it. And a lot of the behaviors that are learned are from way back when we were kids, way back when we were babies. The things I learned today that I'm going to start on right away is the codependency and the relationship things. Um, I've been in a facility four times on this, will be my fourth time, but the things I haven't worked on before are my behaviors with the codependency and the relationships. So obviously those are the two things I didn't work on, so hopefully this time it'll take. I learned that I have core problems that I really didn't uh, evaluate before in my attempts at uh, sobriety. Yes, I have to reevaluate my uh, relationships and uh, as others said, codependent. I just didn't recognize that as being one of my major problems, but today I realize it is. I always felt like people owed me something, but it really was the opposite way. I really owed them because I was taken. Um, with me being in recovery, I learned that 10% of it is drugs and the rest of it is, is behavioral, so I'll be able to apply that. Knowing that gambling is not just with, with money, I'm gambling with my life every time I use drugs the way I use them. Some of my behaviors was flawed that uh, that are newly recognized to me through today's group, um, like codependency and relationships, for example. Um, I had a problem with codependency, thinking I needed to rely on somebody else for my happiness, which is not the case anymore. So that's something I'm learning about as far as today's group is concerned. Yes, behavior was a trap in my addiction. Yes, I got comfortable and afraid to change. Yeah, because uh, I started using at a very young age and uh, just kind of was my go-to and I, I just didn't know how to function without it. But do this, I'm getting to the bottom of it. My behavior was trapped in, in the beginning of my drug addiction. Um, I started at an early age, so it just stuck with me through my life. Mm, absolutely not. I don't see why someone would take it offensive. Um, I think the more knowledge, the better. So for someone to take this offensive, I have no idea why they would. No, not at all. It was real. Um, sometimes when something is truthful, it's hard to watch, but I didn't find it offensive. No, no. I didn't find this presentation offensive at all. I actually learned a lot from it. Uh, absolutely. I don't see why anybody wouldn't want to extra knowledge in their arsenal or their repertoire. Um, but yes, I think anybody who took this class would find this beneficial and would find this very knowledgeable for their own sake. I definitely think others, especially family, would benefit from the information because if they're ones that are going to be supporting you or helping you through your recovery, any information that they can get to better help them understand you is helpful, I think so. And I think knowledge and education about addiction is key. I know they would. It's very enlightening. I believe family and other people will benefit from this because there's not a lot of knowledge out there on the streets for drug addiction. I think the facilitator is a very funny guy. He's uh, pretty hilarious and humorous, so uh, kudos to him. You know, I've, I've been to a few of Steve's groups and he does make it fun and he makes it humorous, but that's what I like about it. It's truthful and you can always learn something. No matter how many times you come to his group, I always learn something new, so I appreciate his groups. Yes, this. This series really helped me a lot with concentrating on what I need to concentrate on. And it helped me to understand more about myself. 
and Steve is a very good teacher. So this is just very knowledgeable, and I hope a lot of people watch it and see it and get to learn something from it.